So when the coronavirus pandemic began, I was already in an acting role. I'd been acting as a deputy AIG after our AIG for audit and evaluation retired earlier in the year, and I was traveling between Atlanta and DC for the role. And on March 12th, I got on a 90% empty plane back to Atlanta, and we started teleworking the following Monday. A couple of weeks later, I ended up on a phone call where I was offered the opportunity to act as the AIG for audit and evaluation. So like a good left-brained person, I made a list of pros and I made a list of cons that was much longer. And despite that long list of cons, I still said okay. In 2019, Deloitte did a study of American workers where they asked people what the highest priorities should be for their organizations. And 80% of people said that it was leadership change and new styles of leadership that should be a priority. But only 41% of those people responding said that they thought their organizations were up to the challenge. In the federal government, we think that at any time, up to 25% of permanent positions are either filled by people in acting roles or are vacant. Our inspector general himself is currently also acting as another inspector general. He has like some agreement with the universe where he gets more than 24 hours each day, I think. But for me, over the past two years, I've been acting for about 60% of the time. Um, unfortunately for people in my organization, I've never had an improv class. I was in my high school production of Damn Yankees and they put me like way in the back of the chorus, which was a good idea. Um, and OPM doesn't give us a lot of advice either. I looked. So I started to look for advice elsewhere on how to act, and that is why I'm here today to offer you three lessons from Hollywood on how to be a good actor. Lesson number one, embrace your humility. So remember my long list of cons. Number one on that list was, I don't know how to do this job. Fortunately for me, imposter syndrome is only a couple of rungs down from humility. Imposter syndrome is that feeling that like you're in the wrong place, in the wrong role and like someone's gonna figure out that you don't belong there. But luckily for me, if I could overcome that anxiety and move to acting from a place of humility, it would not only be better for me, it would be better for the organization. So Lupita Nyong'o won an Oscar for her role in 12 Years a Slave. She was also in some little Star Wars movies that you may have heard about and Black Panther. She was in a Beyonce musical film. Um, oh, and she speaks four languages. So she knows what she's doing, but she still talks about the importance of acting with humility. She says this, every single role brings with it an ignorance and an insecurity. And so you have to approach it with the same curiosity and humility. And I think we can approach acting roles with curiosity and humility. Humility keeps us grounded and curiosity helps us to seek new and better ways of doing things. The second lesson in humility came to me from Dan Levy of Schitt's Creek. Now he doesn't have an Oscar, but he won four Emmys this year for acting, directing, producing, and comedy. He acts in the show with his famous father, Eugene Levy, and also with the storied actor Catherine O'Hara. He talks about how important it was for Catherine O'Hara and Eugene Levy as leaders to come to the set with humility. He says that their humility enabled the younger, newer actors to act with confidence. He says that they were better because everyone left their egos at the door. In fact, social science research has found that when leaders act with more humility, their organizations perform better. So take that imposter syndrome. <laughs> Think about that for a second. When leaders express more humility, it actually compensates for overall general mental ability. So how can we be leaders who act with more humility? I've got uh, four suggestions and then we'll move on to the second lesson from Hollywood. Number one, seek feedback. Number two, admit your lack of knowledge and recognize in others those skills and pieces of knowledge that you're seeking. Number three, notice and compliment others' strengths frequently. And number four, be open and willing to learn from other people. So the second lesson I wanted to bring from Hollywood is to play the role in your own way. <laughs> so I've been in and around the EPA OIG since 2003. I've worked for four AIGs and three inspectors general, and I knew I couldn't 
do anything the way that those people did who trained me, those people who I quote all the time. Um, I have a very juvenile sense of humor, which I'm trying really hard not to bring into this talk here. Um, I have one poker face per week, and uh, this is a world that requires a lot of poker faces. I'm also a natural introvert, so things like this are super draining for me. Um, luckily for me, there are as many ways to play the role as there are players. And Richard Burton actually talked about this when he spoke about um, playing one of the most challenging roles in the theater, Hamlet. He said this, he said, if one man thinks Hamlet is the tragedy of a man who cannot make up his mind and he plays it that way, then that is for three and a half hours what Hamlet is. If another believes him to be a frustrated soldier envious of the delicate and tender prince, then that is what he is. The actors need only the power of personality to convince the audience of who Hamlet is for those few hours. For the record, Richard Burton never won an Oscar. He did win a Tony and a Grammy though, not too shabby. Lin-Manuel Miranda is my other example. He's the creator of um, maybe the most popular musical in American history, Hamilton. He says this about being a musical theater composer. Listen, I'm a musical theater composer because I couldn't just be a musical theater actor. If I'd settled on being a musical theater actor, I'd hopefully be auditioning right now for a production of West Side Story. So Lin-Manuel Miranda didn't see the roles that he wanted to play in musical theater, and he decided to create them himself. There's another word for this lesson that we're talking about right now, and that's a word that's overused, and that's authenticity. We each have a story and a life that we bring to our roles. We each have our own management philosophies and leadership philosophies. Um, the good news here is that authenticity is contagious. A study of 25 Belgian organizations measured authenticity in leaders and then correlated it to how the followers felt in their organizations. And what they found was that the more a leader expressed their authenticity, the more the followers felt that their basic workplace needs were being met. And those are needs not directly related to authenticity like autonomy and competence. They also found that authentic leaders encouraged authenticity in their followers. They sent the signal that it was a safe workplace where you could be yourself and complete your tasks as well. So the challenge here is, right, you can't teach authenticity. It's kind of like counterintuitive. Wrong. There are a few ways that we can do this because those Belgians, they measured authentic leadership, right? So there's a tool. It's actually called the Authentic Leadership Questionnaire. And it has 16 questions divided into four categories. And I think that by weeding through these questions, we can kind of weed through the authenticity garden and find some hints to bringing our own authentic selves into our leadership roles. Here's the categories. Number one, self-awareness. So this category asks questions about whether you can list your three greatest weaknesses, to which I say only three. Um, the second category is internalized moral perspective. So these are questions about whether, as a leader, your morals drive your decision-making process. The third they call balanced processing. And this is about taking in advice from others and authentically listening to people who disagree with you. And the fourth category is relational transparency. So this is about what we usually think of as authenticity. Are you acting as the same person around followers that you do as around everyone else? So we've got humility, we've got authenticity. The third lesson I'm bringing you from Hollywood today is to throw your whole self into the role, or as I'm gonna call it, diving in. So this is the part where we talk about leading with confidence. This is the part where we talk about rallying the troops around a goal, around a big goal, and trying really hard to achieve it. The good news is this enthusiasm is even more contagious than authenticity. So Viola Davis has an Oscar. She also has an Emmy and she has two Tonys. So if she can get a Grammy, she'll be in the EGOT club. She won her Oscar for her stunning performance in the movie adaptation of August Wilson's play, Fences. And if you want a masterclass in bringing your whole self, don't only watch that film, but please do watch that film. Also watch her Oscar acceptance speech. 
in both of these places, she leaves it all on the field. She is giving her all in both the role and in that Oscar acceptance speech. One of the things she does to embody a role is when she receives the script, she writes her own biography of each character. So she determines things that are not in the script. She decides what that person's favorite color is. She decides what their family background is, what it was like for them growing up, whether they had a bike when they were seven years old. She does all of this to really truly embody each role that she decides to play. She says this, she says, embrace your craft with a level of excellence. That way, when God blesses you and you're in a place to be powerful, you will have experience acting with excellence. So we all dive in in our own ways. And the last way I wanna talk about here is doing your own stunts. This is a very different way to dive in. The movie Mission Impossible Fallout, about a quarter of the way through the film, there's this halo jump, and halo stands for high altitude, low opening, and we're talking about like opening of the parachute jump. Um, so in the film, these two guys, played by Henry Cavill and Tom Cruise, they, they like jump out of this cargo plane into a thunderstorm, and they're tumbling through this thunderstorm, and they both apparently get struck by lightning, and Henry Cavill is like knocked out. So Tom Cruise has to like dive <laughs> aerobatically through the air, through the thunderstorm and get to Henry Cavill's character and like give him his oxygen mask so that he doesn't die and then pull his parachute for him and then Tom Cruise pulls his ripcord if that's what you call it and like milliseconds before he lands on the top of the Palais Royale in Paris and uh, he lands completely unscathed of course because it's Mission Impossible what they did to get the shot, which is two and a half minutes long, is they stitched together three shots that were all jumps, actual jumps, from 25,000 or 18,000 feet. To make matters more complicated, the, they had to shoot these scenes at dusk so that they could CGI in all of the thunderstorm stuff later on. So they only had three minutes per day when the lighting was right. So here's what they did. They would get up in the morning, they'd go up in the airplane, and they'd practice all day. And by practice, I mean jump out of the airplane all day. And then, as it was getting toward dusk, they would prepare for the real shot, they would take off, and they would shoot one of the three segments for the scene each day. So it took them 106 halo jumps to create this two and a half minute segment of this movie. Talk about a commitment to performance and results. <laughs> So I wanna say when we're in acting roles, we're not just keeping seats warm. We're there to take action and to achieve big goals. And we don't have stunt doubles. We don't have people we can send in to make the hard calls. Fortunately, there's a couple of ways that we can prepare to be leaders who do our own stunts. Number one is we can practice. 106 jumps to get a two and a half minute segment is a lot of practice. When there's small ways that we can act with integrity and with guts, we can take advantage of those opportunities to practice for the bigger ones. Number two, we can focus on arriving in the roles with our own unique perspectives. Number three, back to feedback. We can ask for feedback often. And number four, we can build up our risk tolerance. We can take small risks. If I'm in that cargo plane, first of all, I would never do that. But if I was in that cargo plane the first day, I would be like, okay, I'm just gonna dangle my foot out there. See how that goes and then build up. There's a current and growing need for leaders in the IG community. And don't misunderstand me, I'm not just talking about people at the IG level or at the AIG level or at the director level. I'm talking about all of us leading from where we are. If you are watching during the conference and you can just click on that button that shows you who the participants are, go ahead and do that and look at the list of names. And like, we're it, y'all. <laughs> we are the ones who are going to help transition the oversight community through these gaps. And unlike me eight months ago, I want us all to know that it's possible for us to fill these acting roles. So go ahead and jump out of the plane or go for that Oscar. Thank you.